All right, I tested this one, so I know it works. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm super excited about our seminar. Um, let's get started. I am Dr. Sarah Brewer, and I direct our education program at Accords. Um, what is Accords? The Adult and Child Center for Outcomes Research and Delivery Science. It's a one-stop shop for pragmatic research, a multidisciplinary collaborative research environment to catalyze innovative and impactful research. Um, we have strong methodological cores and programs led by national experts. Um, and we often partner with these cores for our seminar series. Today, we have representatives from a number of our cores involved in planning. Uh, consultation and team building for grant proposals, um, mentorship, training, and support for junior faculty uh, through our fellowship programs, and extensive educational offerings such as this, as well as a few more I'll talk about in a minute. Um, upcoming events, so uh, get out your calendars, mark these for um, the next couple of months. Uh, in just a week and a half, we have uh, our final seminar as part of our Hot Topics in Mixed Methods and Qualitative Research seminar series uh, on complexity of mixed methods, designs, and approaches with Jody Summers Holtrup. Uh, later this week, we have our CORD CCTSI Community Engagement Forum, um, looking at forging and funding community partnerships. We also then uh, later in May have um, the final in this series on methods and challenges in conducting health equity research with Dr. April O oh from the National Cancer Institute. All three of those upcoming uh, seminars are virtual. Um, and then finally, we are closing out this year with our Colorado Pragmatic Research and Health Conference, June 5th and 6th, that will be here in the Elliman Conference Center in person, as well as with a virtual option. So we hope you'll join us for some of these upcoming opportunities. And then before I introduce our speaker and hand over the floor today, uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, first, if you are on Zoom, please go ahead and use the chat or the Q&A function. Um, if you have comments or questions as we go through the, the seminar today, we will have time for moderated um, question and answer at the end of the talk. For those of you in the room, um, we'll, we'll do that here and just raise your hand at the end. Um, and then finally, uh, complete our evaluation at the end of the seminar today. That helps us make sure we're meeting the needs of um, people who come to our talks covering um, really important topics for all of you. All right, today's seminar um, is part of our Methods and Challenges in Conducting Health Equity Research series. And it's uh, the seventh of eight in the series. And we welcome Dr. Elisa Khan today. Uh, Elisa Khan is a pediatric hospitalist and health services researcher at Boston Children's and an assistant professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. She has led studies to improve uh, family-centered rounds, family safety reporting, and patient safety. She also studies disparities in communication and safety in hospitalized patients and families who prefer languages other than English. Her research has been published in the uh, BMJ, JAMA Pediatrics, Pediatrics, and Academic Pediatrics. Dr. Khan's received funding from uh, HRQ, the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, and the Charles H. Hood Foundation, as well as other organizations. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Elisa Khan today. She presents Promoting Language Equity in Research, Balancing Pragmatics and Rigor. Welcome, Dr. Khan. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Brewer, for that um, kind introduction. Um, as Dr. Brewer mentioned, I will be uh, speaking about advancing language justice and research methods, balancing pragmatics, rigor, and equity. The agenda for today, I'll give a little bit of background about language justice and health literacy, um, share some strategies to promote language access and health literacy in research, um, share a case study um, in which we can apply some language justice research methods for an ongoing R01 study, and um, give some examples of how we might use it in an upcoming study, and then end with some take home points and hopefully time for Q&A and discussion. So um, the objectives for today are to describe gaps in language access and health literacy in current research practices, 
um, to identify health literacy and language um, access methods to advance language justice and research and to apply strategies to equitably and feasibly engage multilingual participants in research. I wanted to start with a few definitions to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, to start with, uh, language justice refers to the process of creating inclusive multilingual spaces where all languages are valued equally and speakers of different languages benefit from listening to and sharing with one another. And the idea is that power is shared and there's no dominant language. Language access is a step towards achieving language justice, and it refers to provision, providing language services, namely interpretation and translation, to ensure that individuals who um, use languages other than English for care can access services. Um, another term I'll be using is limited English proficiency, or LEP. Um, this is the most commonly used term in the literature, and it is defined as responding um, to the US Census item which asks how well do you speak English? It means that you respond anything other than, anything less than very well. Um, however, as you'll note, it's deficiency based. And so there are some researchers, myself included, who are trying to move away from this term and use another term such as uh, using a language other than English, LOE for care, which is an emerging term in the literature and is um, more strength based and a bit more neutral. Um, it, it, there are times where I still will use LEP because it's the measurement of how we define the term um, with the caveat that I think that it is a term that um, is evolving for good reasons. So a little bit of background, um, 20, more than 25 million people in the US or nearly 9% of the population speaks English less than very well or has LEP. Some of the top languages are Spanish and Chinese though this varies by location. And this is particularly salient for pediatric patients since nearly 16% of children have one or more parent with um, LEP. And we know that these numbers are increasing. There are federal protections in place around meaningful access through Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which includes um, national origin as um, a uh, area under which um, individuals cannot be defied, denied benefits or sub subjected to discrimination under programs or activities that receive federal financial assistance. And the Supreme Court has uh, interpreted uh, exclusion of people with LEP as discrimination based on national origin. The Department of Health and Human Services, DHHS, also has regulations that require all recipients of federal financial assistance from HHS to provide meaningful access. Um, and this includes universities who have research projects and um, hospitals uh, taking care of patients that receive federal funds. So um, a wide swath of, of institutions. Um, despite these federal protections, I think in practice, whether we actually are achieving meaningful access in research and in clinical care, I think is debatable. Um, some disparities in clinical care related to language um, are that language barriers can lead to increased adverse events, readmission rates, increased length of stay, costs, decreased adherence and satisfaction. Um, in addition to gaps in clinical care, there are language access gaps in research. Um, a recent study in 2022 showed that only 9% of pediatric research studies that they looked at, and they looked at over 3,000, included participants who spoke a language other than English, meaning 91% of studies were just in English. And of that 9% that included a language other than English, the vast majority, 75%, were only in Spanish. So most research is happening in English. A small portion is happening in Spanish. Very little is happening beyond that in pediatrics. Um, some of the reasons for this are lack of awareness, um, limited guidance about methods, um, limited translation services, limited bilingual staff, um, resources, um, both financial, time, personnel. Some of the implications of this are exclusion and from research, which can have benefits as we know, um, systemat systematic bias, and it really ultimately affects the quality and generalizability of research if we are excluding large proportions of our population. Um, another important aspect uh, component for language justice is health literacy. So I'll take a few minutes to talk about health literacy and research here as there are some overlaps. Um, and uh, I think it's another important concept that is often overlooked in clinical care and in research. 
Um, by health literacy, to start with the definition again, um, this refers to the degree to which individuals have the capacity to obtain, process, and understand basic health information and services to make appropriate health decisions and navigate the healthcare system. It is associated with outcomes and adherence. And importantly, it's a state, not a trait. What that means is it's not something that's necessarily inherent to you, but it's context dependent and can change over time and be affected by things like not just your level of education, but things like stress and pain and sleep deprivation and context and cognitive load. So many of us in the room, despite likely having, like likely being very educated and working in the healthcare system, could have limited health literacy if we're in a hospital with a loved one worried, stressed, and sleep deprived. Um, this is a snapshot of the prevalence of uh, limited health literacy in um, US adults. And essentially 36% of the US population has, uh, or 78 million individuals have below basic or basic health literacy. And we know that limited health literacy is associated with a number of health outcomes, including um, decreased knowledge and skills in various uh, domains like asthma care and chronic self-care management, decreased medication adherence, decreased health screening for things like pap smears, STDs, and mammograms, increased mortality, increased BMI, increased cost, decreased um, vaccine adherence, and decreased health status overall. And we know that there are health literacy gaps in research where we know that he, research does not often adhere to some health literacy best practices, which I'll review in a moment. But if we think to things like consent forms and study materials, survey instructions, and even surveys and questionnaires, they're often um, complicated with big words, complex terminology, small fonts, lack of white space, and often, as I alluded to earlier, are only in English. So some strategies to promote health literacy in research as one step towards language justice are really using what are called universal health literacy precautions. And this is sort of the same idea as universal um, infection control pre precautions where you don't look at someone and say, oh, you look like you have an infection. Let me wash my hands with you. You wash your hands with everyone. And um, the idea is that everyone benefits from clear information and that many are at risk for health literacy challenges, but they're hard to identify and that you can't tell by looking. And as I mentioned earlier, it can vary from context. So some strategies to be mindful of both in clinical practice, but also in, in research, in materials that we use, whether they're surveys or consent forms, information sheets, brochures, study materials, intervention materials, training materials, to use simple words. So one to two syllables, short sentences, ideally 10 words or less, if not even shorter, short paragraphs of just two or three sentences, use lots of white space, drawings, a 12 point font and a sixth to eighth grade reading level or even lower if it's a, a, a population that has um, literacy challenges. Using uppercase and lowercase instead of all capitals. Avoiding italics as they can be hard to read but instead using bold, different or larger font for emphasis. And then using things like headings and subheadings and bullets to enhance clarity. So when you look at this list, I think a lot of research materials don't adhere to um, many of these, these principles. Um, I always like to share how to actually check a reading level because it's kind of a game changer. And you can do it in Microsoft Word pretty easily. You just have to turn it on a couple of places. So you have to go to, you have to turn on readability statistics. And I put a screenshot, this is from a Mac. It's slightly different from a PC, but it's kind of the same principle of going to preferences and um, grammar and then turning on readability statistics. And then after you do that um, on a Mac, you go to review editor and then at the bottom, it doesn't look like it's something clickable. So this took me like 30 minutes one time of Googling to figure out. So I wanted to save everyone from that. You click on that place at the bottom where it says document stats and then this pop-up shows up and you can see the flesh Kincaid grade level for this document, it's a fourth grade level 4.4. And I think, on a, um, I think on a PC, it's even easier. You go to like the same place you spell check and it'll come up if you've turned on the readability statistics. But that's really interesting. Sometimes when you write a paper, you can look at what your reading level is and see that it's like 22nd grade. Um, and again, for research materials, we wanna to stick to the sixth to eighth grade level for patient facing things. So I wanted to return to strategies to promote language access in research and wanted to share some existing translation strategies. This isn't an exhaustive list, but it's a list of, of some strategies that are out there. Um, one existing strategy is forward translation and back translation. What this means is essentially first you translate from English into your target language, 
Then you back translate from your target language back into English. Some of the limitations of this are that back translation can be expensive. It essentially costs twice as much as forward translation and may not actually be helpful. So you may have a false sense of reassurance after doing back translation. Um, and you may not identify cultural nuances or inappropriate register. So there's some thought in the um, language access community that back translation is sort of falling out of favor. Um, a second strategy is the cultural comparability team approach where you have two bilingual individuals who independently forward translate documents. And then in the next step, a third individual reviews the translations for cultural considerations, reading level and accuracy. And then in the third step, all three of those individuals reconcile um, to come up with a final translation. Some of the limitations are that this may be difficult to find qualified interpreters for less common languages. Um, I actually haven't used this myself, but others, I think maybe um, others in the audience have, but I, I don't believe they're using like formal translation companies to do this. I think they're using community members. And so that can be, you know, individuals may not be professional translation translators. It can be time consuming and expensive. Um, a third strategy is the World Health Organization or WHO approach, where in step one, you do the forward translation. In step two, you have a bilingual expert panel review, um, both individually and then in a consensus fashion for things like accuracy, cultural factors, tone, formatting, and then you do a back translation. Some of the limitations are, again, the limitations of back translation and that it may be difficult to um, identify expert panelists for less common languages and can be time consuming and expensive. And certainly if you like I are trying to do research in many languages, um, this can be a really um, extensive process to do this for multiple languages simultaneously. Um, it is however possible, um, a strategy that we used in a recent study that I wanted to propose is a bit of a modified WHO approach where essentially we removed the back translation step. The reason for that was um, partly due to costs and partly due to the fact that um, it is increasingly thought to be not as helpful. So we essentially did the forward translation from a professional translation company. And then we had the bilingual expert panel review. Some of the limitations of this are that it may be difficult to identify expert panelists, again, for less common languages and can be time consuming and expensive, particularly if you're doing multiple languages. But that's just the strategy you choose. There's many more steps to the translation process, both before and after that strategy. So I wanted to kind of go through those because before you um, select a strategy, you have to select which languages. You have to select a translation company. If you're using a translation company, you have to select expert panelists. After you do that process, you have to pilot and cognitively interview your measures. You have to program it electronically, for instance, into REDCap. And then you have to ensure that it's accurate and you've maintained quality control. So I wanted to apply, give an example of applying some of these um, research methods to an ongoing um, study called the iShare study. Um, that stands for the Patients and Families Improving Safety in Hospitals by Actively Reporting Experiences. It's, a, um, it's funded by the uh, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, ARC. It's an R01, um, a multi-center mixed methods um, randomized controlled trial or RCT. It started last year. Um, it's a five-year study that's going on until 2028. We are conducting it on the inpatient general pediatric units at four hospitals across the US. The intervention is a mobile and paper um, family safety reporting tool called the iShare comment card that allows patients and families to share comments, concerns, and suggestions about the safety of their care to inform um, safety surveillance and also quality improvement and safety improvement. And we're including all patients greater than 13 years, 13 or older, and their families, regardless of language. And our outcomes are error detection through the iShare um, comment card compared to existing hospital incident reporting and the impact of the uh, comment card on disparities in reporting by language and by education. Um, and so our modified WHO approach, putting it into practice, our goal was to balance pragmatics, rigor and equity in translating printed and electronic research materials for the top languages at study sites. And our goal was to really push the envelope and go beyond the kind of common practice of only doing research in English plus or minus Spanish. And so we had several approaches to multilingual access. One was we had a dedicated language access working group that was comprised of um, bilingual individuals, um, researchers with expertise in this. Um, and, uh, and we also identified Spanish speaking parent advisors who we met with 
with a iPad um, video interpreter. Um, we also leveraged the multilingual REDCap module, which was actually a new feature for us at Boston Children's as of a year ago. Um, others may have already had it. I don't know if you guys already leverage it here, um, but it's pretty great and really allows you to streamline your database development and just select the language and then copy and paste your professional translations into each item. So you don't have to have separate databases for different languages. So it's a really nice um, way to manage multilingual access in the study. And so you can see even for, for participants, they click on, they select their language and then the database that you programmed in that language comes up, but it's all under the same variable name, which is nice. So we had multiple materials for this study, including a family brochure introducing the intervention and the, and the comment card where they would report their safety concerns. And then of course we had surveys. Um, so what we did was we translated all these materials into the top three languages per site, which was a list of nine languages, including English. So Arabic, Armenian, Chinese, Haitian Creole, Hmong, Korean, Portuguese, and Spanish. And we kind of, we use that modified WHO approach and uh, wanted to take, I wanted to take everyone through kind of a step-by-step -step what we did from the beginning to the end so that it can be helpful for others who may want to adopt a similar um, process in their own research. So our first step was to select the languages. We did this based on the study population and our study resources. And essentially we came up with the rule of, we really wanna push the envelope. So let's pick the top three languages at each site and let us translate our materials in that. There were some languages of course that were shared across sites like Arabic and Chinese and, um, and Spanish. So, and then there were study, there are several languages that were unique to certain sites. Um, I will say for the purposes of the grant, when I submitted the grant, I only said I was gonna do Spanish from a feasibility standpoint. And then after we did get the grant, we thought, you know what, we really wanna try this. Um, and so we tried this process and were able to successfully do this. So step two was we drafted English materials, but we're sure to consider things like health literacy and also phrases that translate poorly. And so I think this is an important first step to look at your English and make sure that when you go to translate it, are those term, are there terms that will be unclear or um, colloquial or jargon that won't translate officially? Or, and are we using big words that are too complicated? Um, step three, we pilot the materials in English with just a few patients from diverse backgrounds. Um, in step four, we did the professional forward translation. We used a professional translation company called Multilingual Connections. They're Chicago-based. I've used them in prior research um, and have had a good experience with them and the quality of their translations has been good. We did a little bit of like test translations with them and then had folks look and see whether it seemed like they did a good job and they did. So we moved on with them. Um, so we moved forward with them. They're also women-led and um, were uh, had good customer service and were good communicators and were able to handle different um, document types. So we had like InDesign files and PDFs and they were able to um, handle the post-production kind of processing. The fifth step was the expert panel review, which is probably the most intensive and labor intensive coordination step. So we identified two to three bilingual individuals per language and asked them to do the individual review of the cultural factors, reading level, formatting, tone, and then um, independently review and propose edits and then come together in a series of Zoom meetings to review the edits and come to consensus. In step six, we revised the materials. Step seven, we piloted and cognitively interviewed them with the target population. In general, it was two to three per language patients. Um, sometimes the materials were too much for one patient. These were hospitalized patients we were um, doing this with and their families. And so it might be that we had each, each, each um, document reviewed by two or three people, but we might've had to enroll six or eight or 10 people to get the two or three review of each, um, of each item. And then our final step was to finalize the materials with um, going back to the expert panelists to ask questions and to then have them also do a quality check of our final electronic REDCap database measures. So we wanted to share some of the considerations that came out of this process. One was that the cultural context we found really affected the resonance of translated terms. So one area was around formality. So um, for instance, the, uh, were the term for you, in Mandarin Chinese, we selected the informal character rather than the formal character 
because it was more accessible, but is still respectful. However, in Spanish, we did the opposite. We selected the formal su rather than the informal tu because our expert panelists said that the latter may have been perceived by dis as disrespectful for some. Another cultural context that, was, that came up was around sex versus gender and sexuality. In some languages, there weren't distinctions between sex and gender or terms for things like queer. Um, similarly, for race and ethnicity, terms were not standard across languages and time and time again, particularly with our Portuguese speakers, there was this idea that we don't really consider race and this isn't a conception in our, in our culture. So that was also interesting to have um, just terms that we have in, a, in, in English that don't necessarily have a direct, a direct translation culturally. Um, education, similarly, there are different education des designations by country, like does a GED make sense to someone who's been educated outside of the US? Perhaps not. And um, one of our items was the newest vital sign, which is a health literacy measure, where you look at a um, nutrition label and answer a series of questions about it. And we found that culturally that didn't make sense for our Hmong speakers because they told us that the nutrition labels don't exist in their culture, nor is there a concept of the calorie. So we realized that this measure that's validated really wouldn't make cultural sense in a Hmong speaking population. A second consideration that came out of this process was linguistic nuances that affect the accuracy of translation. And so these were things like tone where some of our translations um, felt stilted and unnatural um, initially. Others were word choice, like do we pick, when there are multiple equivalent terms, how do we decide which term to pick? For instance, lingua versus idioma in Spanish. Um, also when we were um, translating Likert scales, sometimes terms that have varying designations in English, like sometimes versus occasionally, don't have the same, don't have a corresponding term in Spanish or Korean, for instance. And so the scale sometimes did not translate fully. Um, other things were inaccuracies that were subtle. Um, for instance, uh, what we had written in English was you can select more than one option. And it was translated to mean you should select more than one, which both changes the meaning, but also is a little less respectful and was read as kind of being bossy, like you should do this. Um, another thing that came up was grammatical gender, that in English, um, the language as, a self, as itself doesn't have grammatical gender, but in many other languages, there are gendered terms. So female doctor is different. The term for female doctor is different than the term for male doctor. So we had to make decisions about how do we make sure that we're not just translating doctor to mean male doctor. And so we would have to, in Spanish and Portuguese, for instance, have a parentheses A after that. Um, another consideration was the complexity of ensuring accuracy across print and electronic formats. Um, for non-Latin alphabets, like Chinese and Arabic, it was sometimes challenging for study team members who were ultimately programming the REDCap database or reconciling final edits um, to make changes if they were unfamiliar with the characters. And sometimes a character um, got broken or a word got broken. And if you don't understand, if you don't in a non-Latin alphabet to someone who's not familiar with it, you wouldn't be able to pick up on that. So going back to our expert panelists to do a final quality check was really important. Um, directionality was also relevant. Um, Arabic is formatted right to left. So we had to think about which way does our brochure open? Which way do our answer choices go? Um, there were also some technological limitations like some red cap buttons um, can't actually be translated. And then another formatting piece is when you're doing visual design, Spanish translations tend to take up more space than English. So if you're positioning graphics and words, you have to be thoughtful of the fact that this is going to take up more space when you translate it into Spanish. And then there were also version control things like we had some surveys that were identical, except one was for the patient, one was for the child. And so one said you for the patient, for the parent and for the your child, for the parent and for the patient, it said you. And that was confusing because we had to, sometimes the translation company made an error and didn't necessarily make those distinctions. And so a lesson for me going forward is to avoid having very duplicative surveys that just have one word different just to keep it simple. So in the next study, I've sort of said, we're not using a separate you and your child version because it's just too much to keep track of in eight languages and to ensure accuracy of. The final consideration was that this process highlighted improvements in previously validated measures, both in English and in other languages. So one of the measures we, was, we were using was the um, patient activation measure, which is a proprietary measure. And there are existing validated translations that you can receive from the company. 
And we noticed on the Haitian Creole translation, actually, I think it was a Portuguese translation, um, the Portuguese translation of, the, um, of this measure, it actually was inaccurate in that what used to be a question was changed to a statement. So the scale didn't necessarily make sense. So we were finding errors in validated measures through this process. We also found that some validated measures had really unclear language in English that if we were to do them over, we probably wouldn't use things like when all is said and done or fall through the cracks. Um, and just how complicated those are, both to understand in English, honestly, and then also to then find an equivalent phrase. And it sort of gets the idea back to the idea of health literacy. Can we say it in a simpler way, a more succinct, more accessible way? Um, and I think this really reinforces the importance of doing translations and having this multilingual process concurrently as you're developing measures, not just as a post hoc kind of afterthought. Um, we also had several challenges and solutions that came up, um, some of which are still a work in progress. Um, one was identifying expert panelists. We started by looking at collaborators and then thinking through our professional networks, our personal networks. And then when we couldn't find people, going to the hospital translators to review materials. Um, we also um, realized that our asks up front could have been more clear. And so over time we became more clear in outlining managing expectations from the beginning about what the source materials are and the time commitment. Um, like for instance, I had asked some friends of mine who speak Arabic if they could review some surveys and they were like, yeah, sure. And then when they saw what they were, they were like, oh no, I'm a stay at home mom. Like, I don't have time for this, sorry. And so we learned to be more transparent from the beginning um, about this. Um, and it also compensation was something that varied because really we were truthfully learning this process as we went along. We initially compensated expert panelists $50 for the whole process. And as you can imagine, it was a pretty time intensive process. And so in the future, I'm budgeting so that we're compensating $50 an hour, not just $50. But as you can imagine, we had a limited budget because we hadn't budgeted for all this. Um, so that's another lesson that um, I took away from this to really budget upfront for these. Um, version control nuances, we initially sent documents as Word documents. It was easier to use Google because then you can sort of um, do things uh, simultaneously. We also had a problem of attrition, particularly with our rare languages like Armenian and Hmong, where we had a hard time um, identifying individuals. And then sometimes they you know, stopped responding or had a family emergency. And so sometimes we had to settle with just one person or to then go to the interpreter services department. This also happened with Haitian Creole. Um, and sometimes we also had difficulty finding patients to parent pilot with. So there were some limitations, um, particularly for less common languages. But in the end, we did translate our materials successfully into eight languages in addition to um, in addition to uh, English. And so this is uh, the front sheet of our family brochure, which you can see is in eight of our languages. This is our um, the family comment card where they share comments, concerns, and suggestions. This is also in, um, in uh, eight different languages. I just have six screenshots here though. Um, and so our next steps are to apply this to another study that is ongoing um, called the Patient and Family Center IPASS LISTEN study, which stands for Language Inclusion Safety Teamwork and Equity Now. And this is a um, PCORI study in the uh, Assessing Disparities portfolio. Um, it's another multi-center um, randomized control trial. It's a cluster randomized control trial at eight hospitals. Um, it started last year in 2022. We're comparing three strategies for communicating on rounds with families who have who use languages other than English. And we're including patients and families speaking all languages. We Our measurement materials are surveys, uh, observations of rounds and ad hoc communications, um, systematic safety surveillance of charts, staff reports, family safety reports and interviews. And um, some of our other measures will include uh, family information sheets about rounds and other parent facing, family facing materials. And our outcomes are adverse events or AEs, experience communication and discrimination as well as disparities in those between English speakers and those who speak languages other than English. Um, we have eight study sites across the country. Um, and essentially we uh, paired sites based on hospital size and the percent of families who speak languages other than English. So we have a group of families that speak, a group of hospitals where their percentage of languages other than English are something like five to 8%. 
In the low category, we have medium hospitals who have something like 15 to 20 percent or 10 to 15 percent um, languages other than English. And then we have um, hospitals with high and very high. So about 30 percent um, languages other than English and 40 and 60 percent languages other than English. And um, there are a number of languages. Again, we tried to aim for the top three languages um, across sites. And uh, uh, we also um, enhanced our approach to multilingual access from the prior study. So again, we have a language access working group. We also um, are in the process of convening a multilingual family advisory committee council, where we have individuals who speak languages other than English and are applying for some supplemental funding to help fund simultaneous interpretation because we realized it would be difficult to do that otherwise. Um, we also talked about having kind of monolingual um, family advisory groups, but our language access group and our family advisory council wanted everyone sort of at the table. And so that's the model we're using in this study. Um, we also leveraged family advisors who are bilingual at each of the sites and again, use the multilingual red cap and budgeted for translations. This time in the grant, we budgeted for all of the translations from the get-go, not just for Spanish because it was a larger grant that was focused on language access. Um, and we also, I'm in the process of rebudgeting for the expert panel reviews. And as I mentioned, the simultaneous interpretation costs, which can really add up. And ultimately our goal is to translate the materials and surveys into the top three languages, which are Arabic, Armenian, Chinese, Karen, Quiche, um, Korean, Nepali, Somali, Chinese, and Vietnamese. And our proposal is to use this same process as we did in the, the iShare study. And we're in the process of identifying um, expert panelists. And one point I wanted to make is that um, this can feel very daunting and it often feels very daunting to me. And I wanted to make the point that um, language justice is a journey and it happens in steps and that's okay. And so we shouldn't feel like the perfect is the enemy of, of the good. And I, I put this slide up to show that the first study I ever did as a fellow was only in English. And when the IRB asked me, why are you only doing this in English? I sort of rolled my eyes internally and said, I'm a fellow, it's a small budget. Of course, I'm only doing this in English. And since that time have developed and grown in my thinking, the next study we did, we, did in other languages, but really just did a professional translation, which we hadn't budgeted for. So one of our hospitals um, had free translation services that was part of this study. So we got those translations for free and we only did it on paper. Um, a next, another study, we actually budgeted for professional translation that we paid for externally. We had a bilingual team member review. This was only in Spanish. Again, we didn't have a budget. This was my K award. So we didn't compensate that person. Um, but did um, give them scholarship and kind of bring them on the study team. So they were a co-author on papers. Um, we also had an electronic version of the translation instead of it being only on Span in Spanish. In the next study, the, the iShare study, we, like I said, only budgeted for Spanish, but then rebudgeted to find money from other places to um, have other country, other languages as well. We gave a small honoraria. We did piloting and cognitive interviews, which we hadn't done in the prior study. We also leveraged some Spanish speaking family advisors and used consecutive interpretation for that. And uh, the, final, the, final, um, the final part of my journey, which is still very much ongoing, so there should be a bunch of dots after it. Um, for this, the PFC Listen study, we did budget for multiple languages. We're trying to rebudget to have um, better compensation for our expert panelists. We're doing piloting and cognitive interviews at eight sites. We're identifying multilingual family advisors and hopefully budgeting for simultaneous interpretation so they can be on the table at the table simultaneously as we um, advise for the study. So I wanted to end with some take home points, which are to really strive to ensure that patients who speak languages other than English experience research equitably, to use universal health literacy precautions in research materials, to budget time and money for multilingual research methods. And I know that budgets can be um, very limited. And so some, sometimes you can be creative to kind of work within the limitations you have, whether it's using free translation resources or having colleagues who can do things in exchange for scholarship and you help on their projects, um, things like that. Uh, plan multilingual research methods from the start, not as an afterthought. I think it really improves the science. 
um, pilot materials, both in English and in languages other than English. Um, and don't necessarily consider those English versions final because you'll find things that can be improved once you start the process of translating. And don't settle for English only or just English and Spanish. Even if it's one step, just try that one step. Just try something incremental. Um, just start and build inc incrementally. And I wanted to um, thank so many mentors and advisors and Lisa in the audience who uh, helped us kind of come up with this system and was really patient about answering questions like once a month, like, hey, what do I do about this? What's the best practice? So thank you for that, Lisa. Um, and the Pediatric Research and Inpatient Settings Network. And this is our very large um, iShare study team without whom this work wouldn't be possible, would be possible. And our funders from PCORI and HRQ and references. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really nice to see sort of the detail of your of your process. Um, what questions do we have here in the room? You mentioned several times, Lisa, thank you for your talk, first of all, <laughs> um, you know, identifying the top languages at hospitals. Um, and once you kind of get past maybe the first two, they're often small. And so you're like, well, this year we had this language and last year was this, like, did you have some trouble identifying that and how you dealt with kind of that small numbers, right? At the yeah. Margin. It's a good question. That happened, for instance, one of our sites had a large um, Afghan refugee population that had resettled and then they subsequently moved away. And so Farsi was one of their top languages when we submitted the grant, but then um, by the time we came to do this process, it no longer was. So we ended up actually taking that off our list. So we did have to be a little nimble. We also had to make some executive decisions about where is our cut point? Like, do we, and, and you can do it different ways. You can say, oh, I'm gonna, if person, if the number is less than, you know, 3% of the population, then I'm not gonna do that language. And so I think it's sort of up to your resources and bandwidth. Um, I was trying to really push the envelope on purpose to sort of pick languages that even if there weren't many, I was trying to sort of show that we can do this and see if we could. Um, but it certainly was harder for some of the languages where I would say we couldn't do all the steps like Armenian, I would say, and Hmong and Haitian Creole. I think it was harder to get all of the steps of the expert panel and the piloting. And so for those languages, it might be that we've done some steps, but we haven't gone through all. And, and I think the more I do this work, the more I realize like maybe it's okay that everything is not 100% perfect as long as you're, you're trying and you're sort of striking this balance between what are my resources and my bandwidth and how can I do right by the communities that I'm working with. So I don't know if there's a right answer, but that was definitely something we considered and were um, we're grappling with and continue to grapple with. And I suspect with our other study, we'll probably have some uh, revisions in the languages in real time as well. We've got a question on Zoom about how you have uh, selected your uh, in translation companies, but also your expert panelists. So can you talk a little bit about how you sort of assess those qualifications and find the right partners for those two steps in your process? Yeah. For the translation companies, it was a little word of mouth and a little prior experience and then a little, um, yeah, those, those things and, and, and price and balancing, you know, customer service and how responsive they were. Um, so we, that's how we selected our, um, the company we used and had a really good experience with them. And as I mentioned, we also did a little bit of a test. If you really have the time and energy, you can test multiple um, translation companies and give them a test translation in different languages. You have a lot of money and a lot of time, um, which I didn't. Um, so we did a little bit of due diligence. We had sort of selected this because we had good experience with them. And then we gave them one document and, um, and then we had uh, others make sure it was reasonable. And that's why we selected that company. Um, I will say um, the other reason is you often have to get things like contracts in place 
and business associate agreements, which can take a long time. So there was also sort of a, we had this in place with them for a prior study. And so there was a little bit of economy of scale too. And I think the feedback we've gotten is that this company has actually done a really nice job. And some of our reviewers have said, these are some of the better translations they've actually seen. So it's multilingual connections. I'm not being paid by them, but maybe I should ask them for another discount um, uh, if anyone is looking for a company and they're Chicago based. Um, as far as expert panelists, it was a little bit of a convenience sample of sorts, which again, if you have more time and energy and resources, you could make a project of just convening your expert panels, panelists. Um, we sort of went to um, people that were colleagues that we knew that were interested in this work and understood our research. And we had a some of the people on our study team were bilingual native Portuguese speakers, native Spanish speakers. And so we had them be on the expert panel. Um, I mentioned we were asking friends and family and colleagues. We were asking social workers, um, chaplains. We were really sort of, it was, um, it was kind of like a, a little bit of a yeah, snowball sample. Um, and we were trying to balance the timeline. I would say that this probably, added about three to six months to our timeline, which is not terrible, all things considered. Um, we also had other delays that had nothing to do with this. So, um, uh, but it was definitely a work in progress. So now I think I have two questions. So one, I guess, in terms of your expert review panel, were you assessing their health literacy in addition to their ability to um, be able to provide kind of kind of language <laughs> um, right. kind of review. And then I guess my other question was in terms of, so this is probably a personal question, but so I do <laughs> some research in like child development and using screeners that are already translated into other languages. Do you think, so specifically the ASQ, <laughs> um, <laughs> should I be checking to make sure that those are actually have been appropriately translated into the languages that we are paying for already, if that makes sense? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, your first question around, did we assess the health literacy? No, we didn't. And it's a good point. And perhaps in this next study, we should, um, we're going, I mean, many of the people by nature of being a expert panelist, they needed to be fluent in English as well as the other language. Um, so their literacy was pretty high. They were generally like college educated professional degrees kind of things. Um, again, if they were, if we like with health literacy being a state, not a trait, if we got their health literacy in the middle of the night while their kid was hospitalized, it probably wouldn't be great, but their like best health literacy was probably pretty decent. But I think it's a good suggestion for us to do in the future. Um, as for the question about validated <laughs> free <laughs> um, translated materials, um, I think it depends on what your study questions are, what your study resources are, and how important that measure is. Um, if it's kind of one of multiple, I would probably say it's been professionally translated, I'll call it a day and use it. But if you're seeing consistently things that are problematic, or if when you're administering it, people are bringing up issues, you could think about revising it. And then in your research methods, you'll just say, we revised it for health literacy based on piloting with the source, the target population. I wouldn't necessarily recommend opening the can of worms because I'm already recommending opening a lot of can of worms that are important cans of worms. But I think just to kind of be on the lookout, we, when we did the expert panel review, we actually told people, hey, this is a validated measure, so don't worry about it. And they would still look at it and be like, this language is weird. This doesn't make sense. This is awkward. And then we were like, oh, what do we do now? Um, and so there were times where we said, you know what? We're gonna leave it. And there were other times where we were like, this is inaccurate. We have to fix it. So again, it's kind of, sometimes you have to make these sort of executive decisions about like, how much am I gonna chase the perfection given given that, and I don't know what the right answer is. That was kind of how I approached it. If it's the only measure you're doing and it's the most important and you have the bandwidth and the interest, you could try it. I mean, you don't have to do it with a million people. You could have two Spanish speaking parents and two Arabic speaking parents look at this and say, hey, does this seem like a reasonable translation or is it 
is there something totally off? It doesn't have to be a super onerous pro process, but you might find you might find some improvements. You probably would. And you know, people do different levels of translation, and so it's unclear what the validation is. When we were looking at the PPAM, we were really wondering what was the validation because we got a lot of feedback about the validated measures. We've got a couple more questions about sort of the roles that people played in, in your project and maybe what is sort of ideal. Um, so we all recognize the value of having patient partners um, who are involved from early stages designing studies. Um, can you talk a little bit about people who maybe are serving dual roles and how they're both advising the study, maybe also um, put, giving input on language? And then bigger structurally, we've got some questions about how that might be sort of outsourced to, to organizations like IRBs to have standing expert panels. Yeah. And maybe talk a little bit about sort of those different roles that people could play yeah. in this language justice process. I mean, I love that idea. Like a research, we shouldn't have to reinvent the wheel each time, right? Like shouldn't have to be like going through all my personal and professional networks to f and my colleagues' personal and professional networks. Like this is something we could systematize and maybe it's an idea for a PCORI engagement stakeholder board of expert panelists who are compensated fairly and provide these services for researchers across studies. Um, that would be kind of my dream as an important next step so that this becomes easier and that you don't have to be reinventing the wheel each time and so that you're fairly compensating people for their time and their expertise. And it also could be building capacity and partnerships in, in communities. Um, the first question was, I think, people serving dual roles. Um, so some of the people who were serving dual roles, it was sort of nice because they were already, you know, we were already paying for some of their FTE or paying their salary. Um, and so it felt like an extension of some of the roles they were already doing. And so it didn't feel like I was asking something. Uh, and I, so I felt less bad in those cases. It was the cases where it was someone external to the study and we were giving them a $50 honorarium um, where I felt not as good about it. That said, some of them declined it and we said, well, give it to a friend. And they said, we wanna do this. And there are a couple of people who said, I'll do it for free. This is really meaningful. Our Ar Armenian speaker said, this means so much to me. No one ever does research in my language. And like, I wanna help you even more. So there was also that piece of, um, I think framing it and explaining why you're doing this, I think helps um, build it. I was at the Linguistic Justice Conference a week ago, I think. And one of the um, experts, uh, suggested said, said that sometimes people also like receiving like a certificate of appreciation and it doesn't just have to be like monetary and I thought that was a really nice idea and so that's what we're offering in this other study in addition to paying an hourly rate we're also um, giving them a certificate of appreciation that they can hang up that is you know has a a seal from a fancy hospital and a fancy medical school to say thank you and I think that's also meaningful. I think we have time for one more question if there's one in the room. Okay, we do have one um, from Zoom, a little bit more about logistics. So um, we know that consent processes can often take a while mm -hmm. um, or even conducting the actual research interventions, especially when you involve an interpreter. So can you talk a little bit about how you've handled some of the logistics of, of language justice when conducting research in the, in the hospital? Yeah, I think it can vary from institution. Um, some institutions are fortunate that interpreter, that research counts within the mission of the institution and the interpreter. So it's not like you need to pay extra to use an interpreter for a research study. Um, that being said, maybe that'll change once everyone is on to our grand plan to improve language justice and research and we're using interpreters a lot more. Um, so I think it's just a matter of kind of the same way you arrange an interpreter um, for clinical care. It's you know, calling ahead and scheduling, um, using the iPad if you're in a pinch or, you know, time is of the essence. Um, we also, to my point earlier about health literacy and consent forms and how complicated they are in general, unnecessarily complicated, our studies are, have been minimal risk because they're around communication interventions. And so we have really um, 
tried to argue that we can use a method other than written consent and that that also prevents a confidentiality breach. So we've used information sheets, um, which we then can more easily translate because it's a one or two page information sheet that's written at like a sixth or seventh grade reading level that we can then um, translate um, in a more accessible manner. So those are some of the strategies we've used, leverages, leveraging interpreters, um, trying to avoid the written consent process um, whenever allowed by the IRB and appropriate, um, and then trying to really simplify uh, and use good health literacy principles to really make the research um, consent process more understandable and multilingual. All right, well, thank you so much for a wonderful talk today. Thank you all for being here in person. And for those of you on Zoom, thank you for uh, a very active chat today. We really appreciate you engaging um, throughout our seminar series. Thank you so much, Dr. Khan. Thank you.